està presidint aquesta defensa del doctorat del Víctor Campos, que ha estat supervisada pel Jordi Toros i el Xavi Giró. Són unes condicions una mica especials, però em ve molt de gust veure la xerrada i la defensa del Víctor, que està titulada Deep Learning That Scales, Leveraging Compute and Data. I tindrem una hora amb la xerrada i llavors tindrem unes deliberacions en els membres del tribunal, que serà online, evidentment, donades les circumstàncies. Espero que tots els que estigueu presencialment estigueu amb mascareta, etc. I, Víctor, em sembla que ja pots començar. Molta sort. Gràcies. Ok, so thanks, Oriol, for the introduction. So let's get started with this defense. Um, so in this thesis, uh, we look at deep learning methods and deep learning methods are not something that are very, very new, as in we can find pretty early successful applications of these methods. As an example, uh, you might have seen uh, this one in 1993, uh, Jan LeCon's team uh, managed to recognize uh, 100 digits uh, with computers. And, but it turns out that we have seen these great uh, breakthroughs recently such as uh, AlphaGo, uh, where uh, this machine uh, defeated the world champion in the game of Go, which is something that experts uh, were expecting to happen maybe a decade uh, later than it actually happened. Or GPT-3, this uh, huge language model by OpenAI that can generate text that looks like it was written by a human, and it uh, gets very, very high accuracy rates in many natural language processing tasks. So what happened between these different uh, applications, because in the end, the core of the technology is the same. So you have deep neural nets, you have backprop, gradient descent. So what has really changed between this? And here in this thesis, we argue that scale is one of the reasons why we have seen these recent breakthroughs. Um, so for instance, in this plot uh, by OpenAI, uh, you can see how the amount of compute needed to train different um, applications or different algorithms uh, with deep learning has evolved with time. So in the horizontal axis, you can see the time scale. Then in the uh, Y axis, you can see the compute in, in log scale. And you can see that something changes around 2012. So all of a sudden, the rate at which uh, the amount of compute we use increases much faster. So I guess there's something that happened here in the community. It's not uh, because we are just getting faster CPUs or whatnot. Uh, so there's like something changing in the way we approach these problems. So we think that uh, this, uh, so the scale at which this can be applied has these uh, three main pillars. So we keep the always algorithms at the central point. So these are important now. I'll, I'll get to this in a second. Uh, but then we can increase the scale in the amount of computer and data that we use. But this is not a just you know, increasing the amount of computer and data in a straightforward fashion, as in you take the same algorithm, you throw in more compute, or you throw in more data, and you're done we need to keep this space also from the algorithm side. So this is what we try to do in this thesis. So in particular, as I said, since we always have the focus in the algorithms, we have these two research directions. So the first of them has to do with how to make these algorithms benefit from more compute. And the second one has to do with uh, making these uh, algorithms take advantage of more data. So these are quite broad research questions. So to uh, make this a bit more concrete, um, we uh, have two parts in this thesis. So in the first part, we study how to, so the paradigm of learning from examples. So this means that you have a fixed collection of data. You want to learn as much as possible from that. And then in the second part, we consider learning from interaction. This means that we have some kind of activation that is an agent that interacts with some world, some environment that's generally simulated, and the actions uh, have, it takes have some outcomes, have some influence in this state of the world. So uh, the outline of the presentation is that I'll basically follow the, the thesis in order. So I'll go through the different contributions that we made in order. Uh, so this means we'll start with chapter four, where we study how to uh, distribute training of convolutional neural nets across GPUs in distributed uh, GPU clusters. So as a brief introduction to um, how these neural nets are usually trained, uh, how it works is that you generally have some examples. Like here you have this input image. You pass it through this CNN that stands for Convolutional Neural Net. That's a state-of-the-art type of architecture for computer vision applications. You get some prediction. 
this prediction can be wrong. So what you do is that in this case for supervised learning, you know the actual target you would expect, the actual prediction you would like to get. So you compute some kind of error signal and backprop that through the net in order to update the parameters of the neural net. But we would like to leverage large collections of, of data. So let's say that we have millions of these examples. So processing them one by one could be very slow. So something that we generally do is that we take advantage of the parallel computation capabilities of modern hardware, such as GPUs, to process these uh, data sets in batches. That is, we take uh, a bunch of examples, in this case, uh, just two. Um, we process them in parallel, compute the predictions, compute the error signals, and update, uh, like compute an aggregated uh, update for these parameters. So in this case, we are using uh, two elements in this batch. We could use more, but generally, we are bounded by the GPU memory that we have. So generally, we can fit something like a few dozens of these examples for state-of-the-art models. So what if we want to, uh, what if this is not enough? What if we want to fit even more examples in, in a batch? So something we can do is using multiple GPUs. But uh, this, uh, depending on the exact setting that you have, might lead to different uh, situations and settings. So uh, we studied these two uh, in, this, uh, in this chapter of the thesis. So first, as you can see on the left, we consider the single machine setting. So here you have a single machine with multiple GPUs plugged into it. That generally five, uh, sorry, four to eight GPUs at most. So there's like a maximum number of GPUs you can plug into the same machine. So what if this is not enough? What if you need a few dozen GPUs, for instance? Um, then you need a distributed setting. That is, you have multiple machines. Each machine can have one or multiple GPUs, and then you need to make them kind of talk to each other, right? So that's, uh, those are the settings we study here. So uh, this leads to the actual experimental setup that we use. So this will depend, of course, on the machine that we have. So in this case, we use this machine. You can uh, see in the picture, that's the uh, Minotauro uh, cluster at BSC. So this is a machine with 39 nodes. Each node has the exact same configuration, and, it and every node contains four uh, GPU cards. And these are all uh, interconnected through a uh, network. So we need to choose a task, and in particular, we use the task of adjective noun per detection. Uh, this is a useful task for affective computing applications. The idea is that from images, you need to predict these uh, adjective noun pairs. This could be something like happy baby or crying baby, right? So it's not only uh, predicting the semantics of the image, as in there is a baby in the image, but also some kind of uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, affective uh, bias in that image or in that concept. And we have a larger scale data set for this. So it has 1.2 uh, million images and it contains 1,200 uh, classes. So these are pretty challenging tasks. And for this, we use uh, the ResNet50 uh, CNN architecture. That's a state-of-the-art architecture. It offers a good trade-off between uh, classification accuracy and also computational budget. So with this, I'm going to show uh, some approaches we take for the two settings. So let me start for, uh, with the single machine setting. So this one could be kind of straightforward. We have multiple GPUs connected to the same machine, we know uh, they share some resources. So they share the CPU, the RAM memory, the local storage uh, disk. So what we do is that we simply put um, the parameters of the model in the RAM memory. That's something that all the GPUs can access. Then uh, we process a different batch of data with each GPU and aggregate the updates uh, we make with each. So it's virtually like having a larger GPU that has four times the memory of a single card. And in this case, uh, we're showing the speed up. Uh, so what you can see is as a number of the number of GPUs uh, ranging from one to four, the speed up that we get in terms of uh, throughput, that is in terms of how many images per second we can process. So we see that this scales almost linearly. That would be the ideal case. Because in this case, you know, just communicated, uh, communicating with the RAM memory is generally uh, fast enough to get uh, these good speed ups. So keep this result in mind, because this is something we're going to use for the next step for the distributed setting, uh, which is a bit more complicated. So in our case, it looks something like this. So we have machines with four GPUs each that are interconnected. And then we have this setting where we have two types of uh, threads, let's say two types of, of processes. So we have, you can see here on the right side, on the top, the parameter servers. So this play uh, the role of the RAM memory, but in the distributed setting. That is, 
These are processes that are simply storing the current model parameters, and then they communicate with the so-called worker processes, which are the ones doing the actual computations with GPUs and so on. So each one of these worker processes will take a batch from the data set. Uh, it will compute the forward and backwards passes to the net. It will compute the gradients and send them to these parameter servers. And this will generate an asynchronous update. That is, we don't wait for the other workers. We simply update the weights and, and communicate the updated parameters back. Right? So there's some um, a gradient staleness problem here. Uh, that means that we are computing gradients on a copy of the model that's slightly outdated. This introduces some bias into the gradients. Um, and then what we do, uh, with so something that's different with respect to previous works that introduced this approach, uh, there are two things. First of them is that since we know that it's very fast to communicate between the GPUs within a single node, uh, when we consider worker nodes, we don't consider single GPUs per worker, which is something that had, be done, uh, had been done before, but we know this is the architecture of our machine, so we aggregate synchronously the results for the, uh, results for the four GPUs in each node, and then communicate those results asynchronously with the parameter servers. That's essentially reducing by four the amount of communication that we need to do, and that's reducing also the gradient staleness problem. And then second is that uh, remember that this machine we use is homogeneous in the sense that all the nodes have the exact same configuration. Uh, so generally what was done before was using dedicated parameter servers, meaning that you have some processes running on some nodes that do not have any GPUs that are storing these parameters. In this case, this is a waste of resources because if we use uh, those nodes only as parameter servers and don't use those GPUs, we know that the other users won't be able to use these GPUs. So what we do is that we use the same resources, the same machines for the, uh, the two types of processes. So we have worker processes and parameter server processes within the same machines. These not uh, as fast as uh, you know, dedicated parameter servers, but it's close enough to make a much better usage of the hardware, a more efficient usage of the available hardware. So these are the results in terms of throughput. So you see that we try up to uh, 32 uh, GPUs, that's eight nodes, um, and we see speed ups up to 20 to 25 X. So obviously this is sublinear. This is not as good in the as in the single machine scenario because we have some communication. Uh, this machine is shared with other users, so that's kind of expected. But still, uh, this is good enough to accelerate uh, training runs, uh, which is what we am going to show now. So we care about how long you need to wait until your experiment uh, finishes, until your experiment converges. So in this table, you can see how this evolves uh, as a function of the number of workers. So when we go from one worker that is a single node with four GPUs to eight nodes, we get a speed up that's close to 5x. So this means that now you can train something that used to take around five days in like one day. Uh, so, you know, in, in the life of a researcher, this makes an actual difference. This means that, you know, if you uh, run an experiment on Monday, you don't need to wait till the weekend to get the results. You can get results for this next day. So this is all regarding uh, distributed training of uh, com components. So now uh, let me show some improvements we made to RNN architectures. Uh, yeah. And in particular, um, so, we, so far we have discussed how to train these models. And I think it's fine to assume that we generally have access to large clusters when training these networks. But at test time, at inference time, when we need to make predictions on new data points, we might uh, want to run this on embedded devices, on phones, on laptops, or whatnot. So we don't generally have access to you know, the same clusters for inference. And we would like to generate models that uh, can have different computational budgets so that we can run them in as many devices as possible. So in particular, we study this problem in the context of recurrent neural nets. Uh, these are one of the most common models used uh, for tasks that involve uh, sequences uh, that range from uh, natural language processing to videos and many more. So the way in which these RNNs work is that uh, you have an input sequence. That's what you can see in blue here in the bottom. So that's the X uh, uh, blobs here in this plot. Then you have the RNN, that's the uh, green uh, block. And they generate a different state uh, per input. That is, at the first time step, they get uh, the first input, the first X sub 1, and generate the new state S sub 1. Then you pass that hidden state to the next time step. So 
as if uh, you generate a new time step, which is a function of both the current input and also the previous uh, hidden state, so that uh, you can carry on information in the memory, let's say. So you, you make these uh, sequential decisions. So as I just said, you can see this is totally sequential. Uh, this is what enables RNNs to process uh, the sequential data and have this notion of memory, but at the same time, when we have uh, sequences that are too long, this can generate problems. So some of these could be slow inference. We know that the longer the sequence, the more time we need to process it. But also at training time, we could have problems such as um, it's being, uh, having difficulties to capture long-term dependencies. So let's say that you have two events that are very far apart from each other. Um, even if you have a gated architecture, such as an LSTM, uh, you will be multiplying uh, that hidden state by something that's close to zero, but it's not, a, uh, sorry, by something that's close to one, if, if you want to keep the information, but it's not a hard one, so you might have some small leakage. So if two events are very far apart, say 1,000 steps, uh, you might lose the information, so it's hard to remember what happened very far away into the past. And also you could run into problems with vanishing or exploring gradients, uh, because since you're applying the chain rule, uh, through hundreds or thousands of steps uh, sequentially, um, these uh, gradients could vanish or explode. That is, they could go to zero, so you don't learn. They could go to infinity, so everything diverges, and, and you need to stop training. So uh, we see that these issues have to do with the fact that we have sequential uh, computational graphs that are too long. So let's assume we cannot change the fact that RNNs are sequential. That's like where their power comes from. So we will try to shorten these graphs. And um, how can we do this? Uh, so we propose to do this um, through learning. That is, we will uh, give the model the capability of learning how to solve the task using as few samples as possible. So it's, it's basically uh, like a joint optimization problem. So we propose something we call the skip RNN. Uh, this is uh, a wrapper or a generalization of RNN architecture. So you could take any RNN cell you like, uh, modeled by this transition uh, capital S. So uh, you could plug whatever you like in there. And the main idea is that we add an additional gate, which is a scalar that is a single value for the whole hidden state at every time step and binary, so zero or one. And the idea is that if the value of this new gate is one, you do the regular RNN operations. If otherwise this value is zero, you just copy the previous hidden state and you don't update uh, the RNN. And also, you will skip the current input, as you'll see now. Um, so let me show you this with a, with a toy example. So again, we take the first input and generate uh, the first hidden state. But now we have something that's different. That's the yellow box. In this case, we have this new gate. It's going to be 0 in this case. So this means copying the hidden state. So you can see the hidden state is S1. So when we process, or actually do not process, the second input, the hidden state on the top is still S1. It didn't change. And we completely ignored uh, the input here. So this means that if there is some cost associated to that input, that is, you need to do a reading from a sensor that's going to spend some energy, or you need to do some expensive preprocessing, such as uh, this is a frame from a video. You need to run it through some ComfNet that's going to do a lot of computations. You can skip that because you don't need this for your operations. And this would just go on, you know, sometimes we do update, sometimes we don't. This is learned by the net. So um, let me add that I didn't include uh, the full equations here. I have it at the end if you want to discuss later on, but, you know, uh, since we have limited time, I'm just going to comment this at a high level. And so before I show you results, uh, there is something we can add to this model. So we know that this value of u will be either 1 or 0. And when this is one, uh, it means that we used some sample. So with this, we can define what we call the, if this works, uh, the cost per sample, lambda, uh, which is some kind of measure or estimation of how much, uh, you know, the cost that you need to pay for using some sample. So something we can do is taking the regular task loss. So if you're doing classification, this could be cross entropy or MSC loss for regression or whatnot, plus this uh, loss. So now you have this joint optimization problem I mentioned before, where you need to solve the task with as few updates, with as few uh, inputs in the sequence as possible. So with this, I think we're ready to move on to some results. 
So among the different tasks in the, in the, in the thesis story, uh, I chose uh, MNIST That's one of them. Oops, sorry. Um, so in this case, we have this image classification task. So you get these black and white images and they contain uh, digits between zero and nine. So it's a 10 way classification task. So we turn this into a sequence uh, classification task by flattening these images. That is, uh, we give the RNN the pixels one by one. So it's basically, it sees all the pixels in the first row, then all the pixels in the second row. So we do this flattening row wise. And in red, you can see the pixels it learns to use. And in blue, you see the pixels it ignores. So before actually going into these qualitative results, let me say that this is getting quite high accuracy rates. So uh, above 90%, I don't remember the exact figures, which are the same or better than the corresponding baseline model that sees the whole image. So you can see, first of all, that the pattern of these red pixels is input dependent. So it's not a fixed mask for all the images. So it's something that the net is learning to adapt on the fly. And second, you cannot see this here, but we see that this changes during training. So it's not like, you know, this pattern is fixed or anything like that. And then it learns to deal with it. This is something it's adapting uh, as training goes on. Then uh, another example of this for a more realistic task, uh, it's the task of actual localization in videos. So here we have videos. So the input is a sequence of frames. So every input uh, in the, so every element in the input sequence is a different frame. We process every frame independently with a component, extract some visual features, and then we have an RNN on top to model the evolution of these uh, features over time. And then the task here is to predict what actions are happening in each frame. So uh, the, the metric we use is mean average precision because there could be more than one action at the same time. So for every frame, you basically need to emit a vector with zeros and ones, where every position means uh, whether uh, the, some action is not happening, that is zero, or it is actually happening in the image with the one. So here I'm showing um, the mean average precision in the vertical axis versus the amount of floating point operations, that is the amount of compute in log scale in the horizontal axis. And we compare a, a skip GRU model with our baseline GRU. So what we do is we train the skip GRU uh, for different values of lambda we get the point in this plot. And then we train the baseline with random skipping for the same uh, target uh, uh, computational budget. So that's why we can get you know, the, the orange uh, triangles for our model with more or less the same corresponding budget for the baseline in blue. Uh, so ideally, we would like to use as few computers as possible, as little computer as possible. And, and we see, obviously, there's a decrease in performance as we reduce the compute because we are skipping frames, so there's more chance we can miss some potentially useful information. Um, but we see that uh, the model quality or the gap in model quality is especially larger uh, in favor of the skip RNN models when we are in the low compute regime. Because we know that there's a uh, high redundancy in videos, so sometimes if you skip some frame, it's fine. The next frame will have essentially the same information, especially when you have CNNs with max pooling and so on. Um, but when you have uh, very few frames to use, so something like 10% of the sequence, then you need to be very careful with uh, which ones you use. And then if you choose them randomly, that's not the wisest decision. And that's when we see a larger gap in the performance uh, between our model and the baseline. And then before wrapping up this section, I just wanted to mention that this architecture is quite generic. So we didn't tailor it for any task in particular. So I showed a couple of examples you have more of this in the thesis and actually in the literature, like this work has been extended. Uh, people have used this cell for other works. And some, uh, some modalities or tasks uh, you could find out there are things like natural language processing, like uh, speed reading and things like that. Um, I've seen applications for both speech recognition and enhancement, especially in embedded devices. I uh, just showed you some results with video analysis and there are more out there. Uh, human activity recognition, where, if, for instance, have one of these wearable devices, you, you read uh, from some sensors, and then you need to predict the action that the person was doing, um, things like that. So it's a generic architecture. And now let's move on to the final chapter of this first part of the thesis. And you'll see that the motivation is quite related, because um, for the previous chapter, I mentioned that one of the things that can happen when you have these sequential graphs that are very long is that you could have 
exploding or vanishing signals. It's basically you're playing some operations, uh, you're chaining many operations in a row, so things could go to infinity, minus infinity, or they could go to zero, depending on the uh, values of the operations that you're doing, depending on the parameters. So this actually happens as well for feedforward nets, that is for things like convolutional neural nets. Because in practice, we see that we use these very deep architectures. Uh, you could find applications with like hundreds of layers already. But in this case, you might, uh, you might say, okay, but this is up to you. You could just use shallower architectures and then you don't run into these problems. Because this is not like your input is very long, then you have to deal with that. In this case, you decide the architecture. And this is actually what was done maybe at the beginning of this decade. Um, but what, uh, what happens usually is that we have some correlation between the model depth and the final accuracy. So uh, for instance, here you can see I plot from the GPT-3 paper I, I used for the introduction. So they study how the final accuracy of the model across many tasks changes as a function of the number of parameters, that is the horizontal axis, in their language model. So you could understand the number of parameters as a proxy for the depth, because that's generally like the most efficient way of adding parameters. So basically, like the message here is that the larger the model, usually the better. But it also means that uh, the larger the model, the harder it is to train it, right? So we have this dilemma, we want to use large models, but it's hard to train them. So it turns out that most of these issues have to do with initialization. So with gradient descent, you start with some random parameters and then you iterate on them. And the actual value of this initial set of parameters is very important and it will determine whether the optimization process will be successful or not. So what we do in this chapter is studying initialization schemes for a particular uh, type of neural nets. So uh, this type of neural nets is those that use weight normalization that's a reparameterization strategy that you can use within your neural nets to speed up training. Um, and we do so uh, with the goal of preventing uh, uh, exploding or vanishing signals in both the forward and the backwards pass. That is, we want to avoid exploding and vanishing uh, activations as well as exploding and vanishing gradients. So then you could add uh, weight normalization to like standard feed forward nets, that is without residual connections, but also to rest nets. And those result in different, uh, you know, theoretical results. So we do uh, run these analysis for both feed forward, as in non-residual, and also residual nets, and for the forward and backwards pass of each. So that's like four theoretical results overall. So uh, being more pragmatic, what are the main benefits of the strategies we derive here? Um, so first of all, it's much more robust uh, at train time. That is. We can increase the depth of these nets and train them successfully. But also given some fixed architecture, um, we are much better in terms of how many hyperparameter combinations will work with this net. So it's much easier to, to find the right set of hyperparameters. And finally, even given some fixed architecture and set of hyperparameters, sometimes these things can fail. So we see we're even more robust to things like the random seed. That is, it's much more likely that given some architecture and hyperparameters, our initialization will work well than others. Um, but besides, you know, how much time you spend to actually uh, kick off the training of your model and, and make it converge, we see improvements at the end of training. So in the end performance. And in particular, we see improved generalization. The reason for this is that our, uh, our initialization, sorry, allows using larger learning rates. And this is something that in previous works has been seen to correlate with the type of uh, local optima that you find. And generally, when you use these larger learning rates, you find flatter local optima that have been seen to generalize better. And that's why we think uh, we see better end performance with this initialization scheme. So now let me show you this uh, in a toy example with toy data. So in this case, I'm going to show results for a residual network with quake norm. Then you're going to see two things. On the left, you'll see how the uh, norm of activations with respect to the uh, input evolves um, as a function of the block index. That is, as you go deeper into the architecture. Then on the right side, you're gonna see basically the same thing, but for the gradients. So in that case, we'll start by the end and we'll start back propagating these gradients and seeing how this uh, norm evolves as we go uh, closer to the input. 
And we will see this for two different initialization, initialization schemes, sorry. So in blue, you can see the he initialization. You might know this one by K-Ming or here. So that's the one in a paper called uh, Delving Deep into Rectifiers. And that's uh, very uh, uh, common for ReLU networks. And using a constant gain factor for wake norm, that's like one of the standard practices when people try to uh, uh, initialize these wake normalized nets. And second, in green, you'll see our initialization uh, on top of that same uh, he initialization. So what you can see here in blue is that for both the bo uh, forward and backwards passes, uh, since we have residual connections, you're basically adding things that are rectified most of the time. Uh, the activations will quickly grow and something similar happens for the gradients when you start from the end. So this is bad. This means that uh, training will probably, uh, will likely be unstable. And on the other hand, you can see in green how our initialization offers a much better uh, conditioning on this and the norm uh, doesn't increase uh, so quickly, so it's much easier to train this without uh, divergence, without exploding gradients. So now let's move on so, to some actual uh, like experiments on, on actual data, on real data. So we trained a bunch of nets on both MNIST and CIFAR. So for MNIST we used uh, multi-layered perceptrons, for CIFAR we used convnets, and what we do is that uh, we increase the depth of these nets and then run a grid search on each uh, for different hyperparameters. And you can see that um, in green and orange here, um, the, the baseline initializations, let's say, uh, do not converge when you go be beyond something like 20 or 25 layers. So you get exploding gradients and then uh, you need to stop training. You can't train this uh, successfully. While our initializations, uh, both in blue and red, managed to train much deeper nets up to 200 layers in the case of MNIST. We tried up to 100 layers in the case of CIFAR. So you can see that we are actually way more robust to depth, which is generally the factor that will uh, generate these exploding gradients. But then moving, mo moving on to uh, you know, more modern architectures, let's say, let's see what happens with ResNets. So in this case, we took again CIFAR, and we ran a similar experiment, but in this case, up to 10,000 layers. We only train this for one epoch because uh, the experiments with thousands of layers take forever. But here what we wanted to see is that after one epoch of training, uh, we did not divert. We can successfully train. So you see that um, the two baselines here in orange and brown, um, you know, as you start going deeper, uh, they fail, they diverge. But then you can see that our proposed initialization in red plus one of the baselines in purple managed to train these very deep nets after one epoch. So there's no divergence. Um, though there's a key difference that I'm going to show now between the red and the purple. So something that we can do with our architecture is using much larger learning rates. So the purple one does not diverge, but you need to use learning rates which are like two orders of magnitude smaller uh, to guarantee that this will not diverge. And you'll see that this actually makes a difference at the end of training. Uh, but before going into that, let me show you um, some similar experiments. So same uh, data set, but now we use a standard white ResNet architecture, like the ones you see in the state of the art papers, and try different learning rates for different architectures um, with and without learning rate warm up. And then we record how, uh, how many of these runs did not diverge after three epochs of training. So basically, the, uh, the higher this bar plot, the better. It means that uh, you, more of the runs were successful. A larger fraction of the runs were successful. So you can see that uh, without learning rate warm up, we can use much larger learning rates with our initialization. So all the bars except the red one and maybe the purple for some smaller values are basically at zero. And when we get learning rate warm up, which means you start training with a tiny learning rate and after a while you increase it, it seems that it helps fixing a little bit whatever issues you have with initialization. All strategies become more robust, but ours also benefits from this. So you can, we can go to learning rates as high as 0.1 uh, without divergence. So this turns out to be very important for end performance. So um, when we measure the test error, in this case in CIFAR 10, we have more experiments in the thesis, but for this data set and different architectures, uh, you can see that our initialization manages to find uh, models with lower test error, that is, better models. 
But it turns out that this is not because uh, of better learning from the training set. That is, all these models generally fit the training set completely. The difference is uh, in the generalization. So there's a small, I think, uh, except for this last white resnet that didn't fit the, uh, the training set completely, the rest do fit the training set completely. So what we see here is actually generalization gap, right? So it's not like we train better, no, it's we generalize better. And this is because when we run the grid search, we find learning rates that are larger. And as I said at the beginning um, of this chapter, gen uh, uh, researchers have seen that uh, higher learning rates generally uh, generalize better because they find flatter local minima. And before finishing this section and going to the second part of the thesis, I wanted to show you some initial results with reinforcement learning. So why do we show some results on RL? So it turns out that when you run uh, experiments on these data sets like C4, MNIST, and so on, um, using badge norm is the best thing you can do generally. So we managed to close the gap between wake norm and badge norm, but badge norm seems to get there much easily, much more easily. And the reason for that might be the fact that uh, the badge statistics introduce some kind of uh, noise in the optimization problem that might lead to flatter uh, local optima. But uh, the assumptions behind badge norm are um, might be broken in settings such as uh, reinforcement learning, where you might need to do online learning without batches, or uh, things like in generative modeling, I think they introduce like fake correlations between um, generated samples. Even in supervised learning, uh, you need to find the right batch size for the batch norm statistics. As in, if it's too small or if it's too large, you will run into problems. So it's kind of tricky to make it work. It works under some settings only. So that's why we think uh, um, developing better alternatives such as wake norm and its initialization schemes is important. So in this case for RL, we cannot use batch norm, it's A3C. So we see that our initialization scheme, when using very, very deep nets, like 100 layer nets for Pong, this is obviously overkill. Uh, for this case, uh, we get much uh, faster convergence, much more stable, and it's even better. So in this case, it seems that using wake norm with the wrong initialization in green is even worse than not using wake norm at all. So um, with this, we can move on to the second part of the thesis, uh, where we'll see more of these uh, reinforcement learning experiments. So now uh, we'd like to train uh, these reinforcement learning agents as fast as possible, similarly to what we did with the convolutional neural net at the beginning. Um, so this would be the reinforcement learning loop. So you have some environment uh, that's uh, going to fit these states to the agent, that is, uh, the agent gets to observe uh, the world, the environment, and it will take some action. And this, uh, this will have some result in the environment. It will change the environment so that after that, the agent gets a new state, a new observation, and also a reward. Uh, that's this capital R that you can see here. So this scalar reward is basically telling you how good you are at the task you're trying to perform. And this is actually what we will use uh, to train these agents. So the agents are trained to maximize uh, the rewards they can get. So similarly to what we did with the components, we would like to parallelize this, as in we run as many instances as this in parallel as possible, we get data faster, we can train faster. Uh, but doing this is not straightforward. So maybe you could run different instances of the same environment in the same machine, but as soon as you want to go the, to the distributed setting, say you want to use hundreds or thousands of these uh, simulations in parallel, um, things get more complicated. And there's this algorithm called evolution strategies that actually achieves very good scalability in this type of setting. So I will explain how this works in a minute, but before that, let me show the motivating results. So here we're just reproducing some results from OpenAI's paper. So we try to make that human on the left run as fast as possible. And then we show two things. So we show on the top the throughput as a function of the number of CPU cores. So you can see that we go from 16 cores to almost 1,500. And the scalability, the speed up is almost linear, which is something very difficult, that's very difficult to obtain. Then in the bottom plot, you can see that these actually translate into faster wall clock time, as in something that would take uh, almost 10 hours to train on 16 cores can be uh, run until convergence in only eight minutes when you have uh, 14, 
1400 course. So this is the motivating part, but this has a downside, which is uh, data inefficiency. Now you'll see why. So uh, the way in which evolution strategies works is what you can see here. Uh, so this is a toy setting with two variables. So like X and Y, and you would like to get to the red area. That's like the area with the maximum score or reward. And then the way in which this works is that you initialize these parameters randomly. Then you <clears throat> add some perturbations to those and look at the score that each of the individual perturbations gets. So you try like hundreds or thousands of these. Um, with this, uh, you are able to estimate a direction for improvement and you follow that. That's the arrow that you can see here in these slides. And you can see how this population is evolving towards the area of maximum score. So we could summarize it in this way. So you basically iterate over these two steps. First, uh, perturb uh, perturbing these policies or these sets of parameters that you have, collecting data with that, and then performing one update, uh, you know, following these uh, the equations for evolution strategies. Problem with this is that you could consider this is kind of on policy for reinforcement learning. So what you do is that for every perturbed policy, you collect a complete episode, a complete trajectory, uh, you aggregate all of these into a batch, perform the update, and then those samples are not valid anymore, as in the math doesn't work anymore for those, you need to throw them away and you need to collect more data. So this means that for every single update, we are collecting thousands of time steps or even millions of time steps. Well, this is fine with these simulators that are fast uh, to run. Uh, for some real uh, world problems, this might not be feasible, or even if your simulator is kind of slow, you would like to get better uh, data efficiency, and you don't want to query the simulator so many times. So instead, we propose to do an importance weighted version of this, which means that on top of the standard evolution strategies update, we add k additional updates that need to use something called important sampling to make sure that all the math works out correctly. Um, so basically, the, the idea is that we collect um, these data, these samples, these trajectories once, and then instead of one update, we perform k plus one updates with them. So hopefully this will uh, help with the data inefficiency issue that we've seen with evolution strategies. And in particular, we will evaluate this on this ant environment within the Mujoko suit. So this is kind of complex, as in it's high dimensional for these uh, robotics, sorry, locomotion environments. The goal is to make this ant run as far and as fast as possible. And we choose this one over maybe the humanoid because it has a relatively stable episode length, as in all policies, good or bad, more or less have the same episode length. So, you know, that's another source of possible noise in the analysis that we remove. Though we run experiments on the, on the humanoid and we see similar results. So let me show how the importance weighted version of evolution strategies performs when compared to the standard evolution strategies algorithm. So the baseline that is the version from OpenAI is the blue line here. And you're seeing two things. So you're seeing the reward that the agents get, that is the higher the better, as a function of both the number of time steps, that is simulations in the environment, that is measuring data efficiency. So that's the one on the left, as in how many interactions you need to get to some target score. And then on the right, you see the same thing, but as a function of pull clock time. So let me start with the one on the left. What we see is that basically increasing K uh, is giving us more data efficiency, as in if we do more updates with the same batch of uh, samples, we can uh, squeeze more juice out of it, let's say, um, up to some point. As in, if you increase K too much, then uh, you start getting diminishing returns and it's even a bit uh, worse. But then uh, this also translates into wall clock time because evolution strategies is very good because it's very fast, it's very scalable. You can run it in distributed settings very efficiently. But this is thanks to some particular implementations, some particular assumptions. So you need to be very careful with not breaking this because then you might make the method more data efficient, but then it's not scalable anymore. So any modification that you need to make to the method needs to be compliant with those assumptions to make sure it's still scalable. And that's what we're trying to show here, that the benefits in, in uh, data efficiency more or less translate also into wall clock time. So we are not making the method slower by adding these importance weighted updates. Then we also study what happens for larger models. So that was with small learning rate and small model. 
And one could wonder what happens when you have a larger models, basically because in the math you have a very large product uh, of coefficients for as many uh, parameters as, uh, as you have in your model. So you could think that maybe if you have too many parameters in the model, this will become unstable. It seems that it does not, as in we increase the model size by making these nets, uh, these nets wider. And we see similar results across different model sizes. So it seems that it's, it is stable in that sense. But what we see is that when we increase the learning rate, uh, it becomes unstable. And especially for the largest learning rate we try. So this is 100 times larger than in the previous results. And so what we think is happening here after running some experiments and so on is that um, evolution strategies with this large learning rate is kind of extrapolating, as in you sample around some neighborhood. And then when you do the update, the update will lead you outside of the distribution of things that you tried. And for some reason, this seems to be working. But then when you start running the importance weighted updates, things become unstable because I guess those two distributions are too different now. So this, uh, the math uh, becomes unstable, basically. So I guess this is something interesting to, to study, why this is happening and why this is still working with such a large learning rate. And also whether, you know, in some different type of problem, this might not be happening. So we can see even more gains from the important weighted version. And uh, now let's move on to the final chapter. So uh, I already showed you this plot, so this diagram. So this is the reinforcement learning loop, but something we didn't spend much time discussing is this thing here, so the reward function. So we kind of give that for granted. So someone defines a reward function for the task, in the case of you know that ant that needs to learn how to run, someone defined it. Uh, you need to go as fast as possible, and so on. But how do we define this? Uh, if you're more familiar with supervised learning, this is similar to collecting labels or annotations in supervised learning. And if you've ever tried to train these agents, you'll see that they will learn to exploit mis specifications in the reward. As in, if if you're trying to get as many points as possible in a video game, they might find things like bugs in the video game and exploit them. So this is very cumbersome to define. Uh, it takes a long time. Uh, you need to iterate. So sometimes when you need to uh, deploy these RL agents for real tasks, you need to spend more time defining the proper reward than actually training the agents and doing fancy things with the algorithms. And something we've seen recently in in domains that are traditionally supervised, such as vision or language, is that researchers have, find, have found ways uh, to exploit prior knowledge in order to train uh, large models on huge data sets without any types of labels. So you have methods like BERT, um, like contrastic predictive coding, and so on. So these have really uh, uh, have been a game changer, I think, in these communities, as in now you can uh, leverage these huge collections of data to train these models and then just fine tune them on the target task that you uh, want to solve with few annotations. So this, uh, so I guess this uh, brings up the question of whether we have something like this for reinforcement learning. So can we do some kind of unsupervised or self-supervised pre-training so that now we can become very efficient at the tasks we care about? So it turns out there are uh, some works trying to do this. There are different ways you could approach this problem. Uh, and a particularly interesting way is that uh, that's based on empowerment that's usually derived from information theory. And you have a couple of examples here uh, where uh, researchers have showed that you can train these complex models to learn different basic skills. So where uh, the uh, self-supervised models in things like vision or NLP are learning good features, that is mapping inputs to some space where your data is easily uh, is easy to distinguish. It's generally like linearly separable or something like that. In this case, we are learning skills. That is, we're learning different policies that perform useful uh, sequences of actions that then we can kind of combine or leverage at test time when we need to uh, learn a new task. So what we did was implementing more or less canonical versions of this, but into uh, this simple maze. So let me explain uh, quickly how this works. So it's basically the same maze, so you just look at whatever uh, one you prefer. So you have this maze layout. The agent starts in the black dot in the bottom left part of the maze. 
and then it gets to see its, its current x, y position. So it doesn't see the walls. It needs to learn that there are walls by interaction. And then the action space is basically emitting deltas in this space. That is the shift in position you want it to perform in some, within some range. And then when we train these algorithms I showed you in this task with 10 skills in this case, every uh, colored line that you see here um, is a different skill. So, you know, each of these methods we showed before, if this works, is learning these 10 different skills. So these two different columns correspond to the, more or less to the method they showed before. So the theory is always the same. So that, but the difference why you see forward MI or reverse MI on top in the labels is that on, on the one hand you have the theory, but then you could implement it in different ways. You need to, you know, make some assumptions and so on. That's why we get slightly different algorithms but you can see that they do not explore much. So all the skills they learn, they are mostly constrained to this initial room. One of them seems to go out just a little bit to the right side. And it turns out that this correlates very well with the samples from a random policy. That is, if you just run a random policy, so take the same policy architecture, use random parameters and collect lots of points and just use a uh, orange dot for each of those states you saw, you build uh, this, this thing you can see on the right. So it seems that they lack exploration. They don't provide good coverage of the state space. They're just basically discovering patterns in this random behavior and reinforcing them, but they are not really discovering the things that are possible to do in the environment. So what we do is that uh, we provide some analysis on why this is happening. So this, uh, there aren't, I don't think there are any flaws, at least regarding this, with the theory. I think this is a matter of Okay, how do you go from the theory to the actual implementation, to the actual algorithm? In the theory, you have things like some expectations that you need to estimate with samples in practice. So if you don't do that Monte Carlo sampling properly, or you sample from a different distribution from the one you, you think you're trying to, uh, so the one you're trying to uh, approximate, you run into problems. And that's basically what's happening here. So we kind of uh, find out about this, and then we propose an algorithm that doesn't suffer from those issues. And it's called explore, discover, and learn, and it has these following uh, stages. So first you have this exploration stage. Um, so here you're going to define the distribution over states that you kind of care about, over which you would like to learn skills, and um, find a way to sample from that distribution. So for instance, in the case of the maze, if we have no prior knowledge, we would like to find uh, skills that more or less cover the full state space. So in this case, we would define uh, this distribution to be uniform uh, uh, over all possible uh, states, over all valid states that are within the maze. Once we have that, we see that we can run this skill discovery uh, stage. Uh, in this case, we use variational autoencoders for this, where we basically learn these mappings between states and skills and vice versa. So basically, if you're running some skill, what states would you expect to visit? And also, if you see some trajectory, uh, what skill do you think is, is, is being run at, at this moment? Something like that. And this can be seen also like uh, learning a reward function. So you have now these mappings. So what we can do is use these reward functions at the skill learning time. So this is reinforcement learning time, where you just take your favorite reinforcement learning algorithm, the reward functions you learn it in the second stage, and learn the policies that run those behaviors. So let me show you some results we get in these, in these mazes. So going back to the motivating example, now with our method EVL on the right, you can see that we managed to get much better coverage of the state space. So the skills discovered by EVL do actually leave this room and uh, find different patterns uh, in this state space and in the environment. Then we can also incorporate priors. So in this type of maze, you can see that if we run the baselines first on the top, first of all, uh, they don't get very good coverage, as in they don't really get to the end of all the corridors. If we run EVL without any prior, so that's the bottom left uh, figure, you see that we get skills that more or less cover the full state space. But then we could add some prior. So for instance, here in the bottom right, our prior is um, visiting or, or discovering uh, skills that visit this right side of the maze. And then we see that all the capacity of the model is spent in learning these skills that you care about. So where can this be useful? So you could think about 
complex humanoid robot, for instance, you know that probably this robot needs to be standing all the time, as in you want the robot to be laying on the floor or doing weird things on the floor. So you, for instance, can add some prior on the center of mass to be you know, above some threshold in height. Or you know that maybe it needs to be walking around, so you can add this kind of prior as well. Or there are some regions of the state space that are not useful for your tasks, so you don't need to spend capacity on that, things like this. And then finally, what we see is that we can interpolate in skill space. So all the results I showed are for a discrete number of skills. So they all uh, are trained uh, to discover 10 different skills. The main reason for that is that previous works used discrete skills. So you basically discover 10 different policies, let's say. But each policy, so this is a VQVA. So you basically have a, a code book. So you can just go to the row you care about and, and pass that vector to the policy. But you could also select two different uh, codes in this code book and interpolate between them. And that's what we're seeing here. So the brown uh, lines are the, are the uh, trajectories you get for one of these codes. Uh, the blue one on the left is another one of those. And finally, uh, in this, uh, let's say, bottom right uh, plot, you see all different types of interpolations. So the color code is, again, similar to the interpolation we run. So you can see the blue scale and the brown scale. And then all the colors between, let's say, blue and brown uh, are, are representing the amount of blending we do from each of the two codes. So you see that it's kind of learning to interpolate in terms of the final position um, in the state space. But you know, this is not something we impose when the, uh, developing the algorithm. This is like a, a byproduct uh, that we find out after uh, training this. Um, and now let just uh, let me uh, wrap up uh, with some conclusions. So. We argued that there are these three main pillars of scale for deep learning uh, applications. So we have the algorithms and their interaction with compute and data. So regarding uh, algorithms and compute, um, we studied how to distribute training of convolutional neural nets on GPU clusters to train much faster. And similarly, we did, uh, we did this uh, with uh, evolution strategies and reinforcement learning agents on a cluster of CPUs. And then when it comes to um, algorithms and data, uh, we, we um, studied how to train RNNs that are able to skip some inputs, some uh, input patterns. We developed uh, initialization schemes that are more robust and that enable training much deeper models that should be able to exploit uh, larger data sets. And finally, uh, we developed better uh, tools or better algorithms for unsupervised skill discovery in reinforcement learning. Hopefully, these type of methods will let us train in much more complex environments while keeping the human kind of out of the loop so that we don't become the bottleneck when defining these rewards. And these methods can uh, learn from more complex environments, basically. So if we want to uh, keep uh, pushing this or you know, keeping this trend, just some thoughts on both sides. So let me start with algorithms and compute. Um, I think that one interesting uh, research direction is basically uh, software and hardware co-design. So what this means is that we are using things like GPUs. I guess GPUs were designed basically for gaming. You could use, this, you could use them for many different things. So you know, they are useful for our tasks, but they also have things like that we do not use, so that comes at a cost, that uses some energy. So we could uh, build devices specifically for this. So first of all, we know that we might need to use parallel hardware because that's the fastest way to add more computing power nowadays, instead of just waiting until faster uh, processors are found and released. So things like NVIDIA Link that uh, allow fast communication across devices, I think uh, it's very interesting and useful. And similarly, things like uh, specialized hardware, such as GPUs, where you basically basically take GPUs, remove all the things you want to use, and then add more of the components that you actually use. Then regarding the algorithm side of this, I think we can also the, um, so develop methods that are inherently parallel and take advantage of the hardware that we have. So examples of this could be neural architecture search, where you could run training processes on different GPUs or GPUs or whatnot, then aggregate the results over this you know, whole population of nets you're training and learn from that. 
And similarly, maybe for the RL side, things like population-based training of agents is an inherently parallel method that can benefit for, from these clusters. Then regarding algorithms and data, um, so you think that rich data is already available. So if we look, for instance, at the trends in how the internet is growing, it seems that it's doubling in size every year. Uh, so the data is actually there. And in terms of simulators, I guess we already have very complex simulators. At least, you know, if you if you look at things like the video games, like commercial video games, and the video games we use for RL research, uh, there's a huge gap between, you know, uh, these PlayStations and, and the Atari console we are using, which is decades ago, uh, old, sorry. So what I think is that generally humans are the bottleneck for this. So we need to generate some kind of annotation, uh, either in terms of uh, actual labels for supervised learning or reward functions for RL. So I think developing these unsupervised or self-supervised methods is very important to keep this trend. But also, it means that if we manage to develop these self-supervised or unsupervised methods, then we need to be able to reuse that uh, knowledge efficiently. So I believe that transfer is one of the key research areas from now on, especially if we want to get to more general AI systems. Uh, so things like the fine tuning we use for BERT is fine, but it does not really scale to all the tasks. Uh, so, you know, basically uh, keep accumulating knowledge and transferring that efficiently is, is very important. And uh, well, before I finish, uh, I guess I would like to show the, the list of publications. So everything uh, we I've discussed today has been peer reviewed and it's published. And I would like to thank, I guess, all the uh, co-authors uh, here uh, for their help and how much I've learned from them. And if I may, I might switch language just for a minute. So, magradieta magradi als als nos directors, no and. Xavi al Jordi pel, pel su suport tot aquest temps. O amb el Xavi a més he estat fent recerca des de que vaig començar a fer recerca i, i sempre m'han recolzat fins i tot quan hem fet canvis de tema com de cop vaig arribar un dia i volia fer reinforcement learning no? i, i m'han dit endavant i, i som i ja, ja ho solucionarem i, i crec que ens ha anat uh, molt bé. Llavors, moltes gràcies pel, pel suport i bueno, el Jordi també que ens estarà sentint. <laughs> I bueno, ja, últim canvi d'idioma, no? I bueno, a, a mi família també, i Paula, perquè al final eh, me l'habéis puesto molt fàcil perquè els únics problemes que haya tenido realment són aquests que he presentat aquí i nada més. Um, and that's all from my side. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take questions now. Thank you very much. Let me move. We are.